Hello everyone, welcome back to the Christ Motor GP podcast and there is no action this week but we have plenty to talk about and first of all we're going to start with a report that was in the Financial Times and at the time we recorded this podcast we don't know if there's been any official news yet but essentially Liberty Media, the owners of F1 are close to agreeing a 4 billion euro deal for MotoGP so that would be to buy the Dorna share in MotoGP and yeah Pete we'll start with you first that is very uh, big news and what's your initial take on it? As you say, John, this has been going on in the background, hasn't there? There's been these rumours of a possible sale and and, uh, and everything else, and it seems like it's it's getting closer and there might be something more to it than just the normal rumours. Uh, we were talking before we came on air, weren't we, about what liberty is and all that kind of thing, what they might do. But uh, uh, just to sort of confirm, really, in, in MotoGP, you have the Grand Prix Commission that makes the rules, don't you? And, and that's the FIN, yeah. Hurt, uh, Dorna. Um, and then the uh, MSMA. So there's sort of four parties in there. So this is not like if you buy a chunk of the the commercial rights, which is what we're talking about, isn't it? That you automatically could could make all the rules different. It's not as simple as that. But certainly if it goes ahead, you have to assume that the idea is to sort of mimic what's gone on in F1 and see if you can do it on two wheels. And uh, I mean, I haven't followed the F1 side too closely, but it certainly seems like in recent years, it's got a lot more popular. And so maybe they think, you know, MotoGP has some untapped potential in that regard. Definitely. And Rob, like Pete says, they are essentially the marketing behind F1. And they have done an incredible job since they bought over from Bernie Eccleston in 2017. And you know what it's been like. I watch F1, you watch F1. The amount of social media eyes and numbers, it's just been incredible. And to see this, you know, I think... Mostly it's a positive step if it goes ahead. Would you think the same? I would. Uh, Like you said, the popularity in Formula 1 right now, even in a time where, you know, a lot of people will probably say that throughout the history of F1, there's always been dominant periods. uh, And we've sort of been going through another one in the the last few years, pretty much since 2021, with Red Bull dominating. But even so... The, the popularity and the way they've been able to get eyes on the sport has been incredible. And I think from that side of things, for MotoGP, it could only be a good thing. You look at you know the introduction of Drive to Survive on Netflix. Yeah. They, they've done so much in a, in a short amount of time as well um, that I think it can only be a good thing for MotoGP in terms of just getting more eyes on the sport and bringing more attention to the sport and, and just growing it in, in general. And that's what, that's the biggest takeaway when you look at what they've done with F1. That's what they've been able to do. Uh, so I think it would be a massive step forward for MotoGP, who are already um, in a very good place. There, there's more exactly. eyes on MotoGP. I mean, we saw the numbers just in Portimao um, for Miguel Oliveira since he's been there. Every year, yep. it's been getting more popular in Portugal. And if Liberty Media take over, I think that's only going to get get bigger. Yeah, you could even see that. Like it was, I've seen the MotoGP post they put out on Sunday. It was around forty-two percent of an increase of attendance at the Grand Prix as well. So it just shows you MotoGP is trending in the right direction. But like people are kind of worrying about it. Our fans are saying that you know they're going to come in, they're going to ruin the sport. You know they they can't do that. They don't have, as Pete said, they don't have the regulation control to just change bikes and everything. That is with the FIM and, like I said, the other bodies that we have in MotoGP. But yeah, I, I think it's a, a positive step. You know, the Financial Times, they wouldn't be reporting it if it wasn't true. You know, they have, of course, a, an incredible reputation for things like this in business. So let's see what happens. Like we say, at the time of recording, nothing is official yet. But yeah, one to keep an eye on. And let's see how it unfolds but this week's podcast is about Pedro Acosta the rise of Pedro Acosta and Pete you know it's hard to believe really that he's only been in Grand Prix racing this is his fourth season and he's already won two world titles what is your first sort of memory of Acosta when he joined Moto3 I think probably like most people, it would be that that win from pit lane in Qatar, wouldn't it? I know he was on the podium the, the week before. It was yeah. back-to-back races, wasn't it? But I think if you're asking for the first memory, bang, straight away, that pit lane win, unbelievable, even now. And uh, certainly when I was speaking to Hervé Poncherel last week, that was the moment also when he you know, really knew Acosta from there was something special. We've seen guys win as rookies coming into Moto3, but to do it from pit lane, yeah, that, that was pretty amazing. 
Yeah, and Rob, same question goes to you. What is your first memory of Pedro Acosta? Like Pete said, the way he, you know, joined the championship and introduced himself with, with the win in Qatar, um, and then you know he he had five races in. I think he had four wins, and that's yeah. where the bulk of his success in Moto Three in that rookie season came. Um, and but his consistency, and I think the biggest takeaway for me, you know, because he's still a teenager four years later in MotoGP, but the way he came into that championship and dealt with pressure and the way he's dealt with it throughout is probably the biggest takeaway for me. It's we've not seen many riders be able to achieve the results that he has so quickly, but in turn, the consistency and the way he's done it under pressure is someone of someone much beyond their years. And I think that's been the most impressive thing for me. Yeah, and just to add my thoughts on it, it is, of course, that race in Doha that he did have. You know, I have the stats here. He started from pit lane. He's a bit of a naughty boy. I was saying to Pete before, I had to refresh the memory. You know, he got a penalty for starting the pit lane because he was irresponsibly riding in practice. At the start of the first lap, he was 9.2 seconds off the leading group. And you think, you know, there was a group of them that were all in the pit lane and they just kind of pushed each other along and he headed that. But the way he won that race, he just arrived into the pack and it was just like, I'm here, I'm going to win it. It was like once he got there, there was no stopping him. And yeah, his rookie year, like Rob said, the, he got most of the wins early on and then they go through a bit of a, a lull where it kind of tested his mentality, Pete. And... For someone so young, you know, he, he was 17 by the time he won the world title in Moto3. He showed so much maturity compared to other riders in the class. That I don't think many people really would have seen. You know, is there anyone you can think of, Pete, in the past that shown this in the lower classes especially? I, I don't think so as a rookie, no. I mean, we're used to people having that first learning year, aren't we? And then the second year you go for the title, you look at guys like Rossi, things like that. That was the sort of pattern that he followed, wasn't it? You might get some wins in the first year, but you're too up and down to really go for the championship. And uh, as you guys were saying, that what, what was impressive was perhaps by the time he got to the second half of the year and had all that championship pressure, yeah. he still died with it, wasn't it? Because that was when the pressure came for the championship. It was, look, you can see the end of the season now. It's not far away and you're... You know, you're the favourite now. And that's when people can really start to crack and start to feel the nerves. And he didn't. He dug in and he got the job done. And uh, yeah, and, and so everybody then had big expectations for Moto2, didn't they? Too big, probably. And he also put, I think, too much pressure on himself in that Moto2 debut year. But I think that the difficult times that he had there, and I'm sure you're going to come on to it in a minute, Jordan, that's actually stood him in good stead now for the yeah. pressure that you have in MotoGP. You know, and Rob, just finishing off on the Moto3 season, yeah, I think back to the races that, you know, there was that race in Texas where they had that massive crash on the back straight that time, and he was involved in that, and he was so lucky to not hurt himself because, I forget who it was, it was it Jeremy Alcoba, and was it Dennis Onchu, and there was a lot of weaving on the straight, and whatever happened, happened and he got caught up in that and actually rode over a bike and ended up in the armco essentially and he just you feared the worst then it just caught and he was okay you know for even the mentality at that age to have such a big crisis it's just scary but within your first year of grand prix racing shows a lot of you know mental toughness as well yeah absolutely i think we've seen that um you know in the way in his first year of moto 2 following that how he dealt with injury um we've seen him be able to overcome very difficult situations given his age. That's that's the big thing, you know. A rider, let's take Mar Marquez for example, when he had the shoulder injury, he was very much into his MotoGP career. Had won a lot of world championships. Was accustomed to being at the front and accustomed to to being in the paddock and having all yeah. eyes around him. Acosta was very different. Yes, there was expectation even going through that season in Moto Three and when that incident happened. But I think that that ability to to sort of switch that off and just treat it as like a one-off, something that won't happen again and just get back to racing and almost forget about it is something that not many people, not just in, in general, would be able to do, but a lot of other racers might struggle with. But he's, whatever has come up in his career so far, he's been able to process and move on from very, very quickly. Yeah. I think that's why his trajectory has gone the way it has and he's been able to, to adapt and, and move past things very quickly. Yeah, 
And just to, to finish off the Moto3 seed, so he finished off with six wins. He won the world title. He was the second rookie to win the lightweight world class as Loris Caparossi in 1990. You know, and the crazy stat is they were 17 years and 165 and 166 days. So literally one day between them in the stats as well, which is a pretty cool thing. But as Pete said, you know, Moto2, Pete, it's a difficult class, you know, when we see that transition. And he did struggle at the start, but they, soon after that, you know, it was around his sixth race at Mugello, he won it. And we've seen this pattern before. Mark Marquez went through something similar in 2011. You know, he really struggled at the start. And then he got that first win in Le Mans, and it just changed his season. But then, you know, looking at Acosta, he was unlucky with injury. And it's comparable to Marquez in 2011, who had, of course, Diplopia, and it cost him the world title. But yeah, Acosta went through that similar transition period, don't you think? Yeah, and the big difference with that motor, that first motor two year, was all the expectation. And that's why, coming to this year, he doesn't want to say, you know, this is, I want to be in the, in the, in the front two rows on the grid at the next race, so I want to be finishing in the top five. Or This is the reason, is because he's going back to that motor two year yeah. where he came in rookie champion everyone going you can win this you know you you can make it two in a row as a rookie and he, and he was with the ao team still so he started to believe all the hype a little bit too much and then he struggled as you say it was at the first half a dozen races not even i don't think anywhere near the podium in terms of the results yeah um as you say it all came good for him at bagello so then it was okay now he's back on course then he has the training injury breaks yeah. his leg and, and, and that's the title over isn't it but then he comes back and he proves that he can master the Moto2 bike, gets the wins, and everything's then in place for the following year. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's also, it's a big step, Moto3 to Moto2, isn't it? It's probably the biggest step between the 100%. classes. Three yeah. times the engine size. Throw in some electronics as well and all that kind of stuff. So it, it is a big step. I think he maybe underestimated it a little bit because of almost how easy things had been in Moto3 as a rookie winning in that first year. But yeah, I think that was a, a key moment in his career, and it's, it's influencing why now... He's just going in with a, you know, his mind clear to in each MotoGP race, not putting that pressure on himself. Because as he said, I, I think he was at the Spain test, he said, look, the only time I put expectations on myself was that rookie Moto2 year and yeah. look what happened. So he's not making that same mistake again, which also fits in, in with his sort of personality of he learns from everything, doesn't he? He doesn't yeah. make the same mistake twice. Yeah, and I suppose the environment that he was in, Rob, it was the best environment possible. You know, he's came through his earlier years in the Moto3, Moto2 with the Red Bull KTM IO team. And I suppose there's no better place for someone who has that much talent. We've seen it with Mar Marquez in the past. He went through it in 125. Aki IO is an incredible manager of talent. And having the struggles, like Pete said, in the first year of Moto2, you know, he was able to be grounded by Aki IO to keep that focus still. And how crucial do you think that has been for his development? Like you say, he has struggled with injury. And Pete said, you know, he broke his femur and missed two rounds, but still came back and shown, you know, the talent was still there and his mentality was right going into 23. You know, what, what, what's your thoughts? I think it's been, it's been huge. As you said, there's been a lot of riders who have gone through that, let's say, development school with Akiyo. And he's been not only crucial in um, having an eye for talent and spotting the right riders and, you know, I, I was going to bring up the point of Acosta ended 2022 as the fastest Moto2 rider and then was dominant last season. And we've seen other riders, not only in Moto2, who are now in MotoGP, but other riders who have gone through that system with Akio, like Miguel Oliveira, Brad Binder, who didn't win yeah. a title in Moto2. And look at the success they've had in MotoGP. And Acosta seems to be following that path. I think that the impact Akio has in terms of, you know, his team is known for winning in Moto2. They're one of the best teams and they're sort of a winning machine. And the way they operate, I think, is crucial for a young rider. And I think the way, especially at the age Acosta was, to help mould Acosta into sort of this rider who is grounded, has got a little bit of, you know, cocky confidence to him and he knows his talent, but he also knows what he needs to do, how he needs to apply himself. I think yeah. that's a big learning curve that he got through that sort of Akio school. Yeah, like Rob says, Pete, the Moto2 class, you need, we think back in the past, the 250s as well, we've seen riders like Jorge Lorenzo, Danny Pedroza, even Casey Stoner, you know, 
the first time when he went up to 250, he struggled. But then, you know, he dropped back down to 125, had that learning year in 2000, and I think it was 2004, where it was Davizioso Lorenzo. Then they all moved up together. You know, the, the class is such a difficult class with talent. And you know, how, how do you think it can shape a career, that intermediate class? Is it one that can, you know, elevate you to even greater things or can you just sink? You know, it's one of those classes, isn't it? I think you're exactly right, John. I think it's all, you could almost call it make or break. I mean, look at some of the guys that have come up, even as champions of Moto3, yeah. and they really struggled. And we, we can see some on the grid now even, who, you know, were being praised as the next big thing for MotoGP in a few years. And they haven't really shown anything like that potential yeah. in Moto3, in Moto2. So it, it really is. It, it's, a, it's a make or break class. All of the mani- all the, the MotoGP manufacturers also know the bikes are pretty much the same, aren't they? Okay, you've got the speed-up chassis and the Calex, but... Generally, it's a good gauge of talent, isn't it? Because everyone's on the same machinery, pretty much. Obviously, the tires are all the same as well. So, it, it's, yeah, it's um, if you deliver in that class, in that environment, you definitely get the attention of the MotoGP teams, and uh, you know for good reason. And uh, yeah, you know, Acosta, okay, that that first year it didn't go to plan, but he did get the uh, the first win. He became the youngest MotoGP Moto2 winner, didn't he? So there was yeah. something there for him at least. <laughs> exactly, and, and like you say, the records that he has. I don't think he really understands. I don't think he really, not really cares, but like you look at just even going back as far, he was Red Bull Rookies champion too. And he was third in that same year in CEV. You know, his, his CEV is so just, it's it's a glittering CEV in terms of just for how long he's only been racing. It's incredible. You know, in the, from this podcast, when it's recorded, he has 16 victories, 28 podiums, two world championships in four years of Grand Prix race. And, and it's just incredible when you think about it. And Rob, you mentioned, you know, going into 23, he was the fastest rider. And sometimes, you know, it can break people, you know, that expectation. But straight out the gate, wins in Portimao last year, and that set the tone for the year, didn't it? It did. And even to use it, uh, an example of how Acosta was able to to manage the pressure going into the year where he was expected to win, which he did. Let's look at Fermi Naldeguer this season. Obviously, the Ducati news has been great for him, and he finished last year with Acosta being the top rider, and obviously his own mistake in Portimao, but he had a disaster in Qatar, uh, was off the podium in Portimao, and those are not the results we expected at all, but Acosta, it was a case of end of 2022, the way he would have liked to have started the season. And then it was almost, he didn't get caught up in how he ended that season and whether he could do it again. He just, he just rolled with the punches essentially and was just from the, the get go, the rider to beat and showed blistering pace, the sort of pace that backs up, you know, those stats that you mentioned, all the wins and podiums he's had, which for his age and his experience in the championship and to have done it across classes, it's not like he's just stayed in Moto3 and generated all those stats. He's almost the way you look at his progression, he's almost bypassing the learning curve, which is crazy to think about. Because every time he steps on a bigger bike, he acknowledges there's a learning curve, but his riding and his lap times don't suggest that there there is one almost. Um and that was true. pretty much what happened in his um <clears throat> in his second year in Moto Two. He just reset, went again, and was pretty much un- unbeatable and Tony Arbellino was his biggest challenger and quickly fell off with yeah. that consistency that Acosta was able to to demonstrate. Yeah, so 2023, he had seven wins. It was pretty dominant. I think it was the most points scored in a Moto2 season ever. I think, and obviously, you can take into account we have more Grand Prix, of course, but still, you know, he, he finished the races and he dominated the championship. Pete, I want to talk about his personality because I, I read a group report. It was from, I was in Italy, and they talked about the personality then Acosta reminds him of Valentino Rossi a little bit. You know, the celebrations, we've seen the one last year, I I thought it's still hilarious, the, the pizza box celebration. You know, he arrived in the pit lane, he was handing out these pizza boxes, he even had it on the Tony Arbolino's mechanic in a bit of a sarcastic way. You know, he wore the lederhosen in Austria. He's a, I think he said before that he wants people to, you know, have someone that they can, just have a laugh at essentially and you know shows that he's not really taking it too seriously yeah exactly he's showing that he hasn't got this ego or anything about him in that way has he and i, th- I think going right back to his background you know his, his dad's a fisherman 
Yeah, he comes from a humble background of the whole shark thing, isn't it? I think that was on his dad's boat, maybe. That, yeah, that's, that's true. That's where it came from. So he's, you know, he, he brings all that with him. He's a working class guy, lad, you could almost say it, it's still a teenager. And, and he, he acts in that way. He's got no pretentiousness about him. No, you know, I'm a, I'm a big star. There's none of that. As you say, Aki, I'm sure has played a good part in keeping him grounded. But even so, his whole family atmosphere is that way as well. So uh, that that's that side of things. And then you've got the, at the same time, he understands, it's almost a contrast, but as you're saying, he understands that it's a show. You know, people yeah. come to be entertained. They come, they want somebody that, that they can, you know, get to know more than just the race result. They want they want someone they can really root for, and they want the excitement and the battles and, and the controversy sometimes. He, he gets all that, doesn't he? And it, it is exceptional that at such a young age, he does understand more than just riding the bike. And, and I think that's where the, the comparison that you're making with Rossi is also valid in that Rossi obviously understood it was about more than just what you did yeah. during the during the sessions on the bike. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's definitely the case. Yeah, and, you know, Rob, we've seen people in the past, you know, I think of Jorge Lorenzo, he loved the celebration too, of course, planting Lorenzo's land flag in the gravel and stuff. And a lot of people didn't like that, maybe because, you know, Lorenzo's around a time of Valentino Rossi and you know what it was like, it was very heated between those two but you get characters who just want to show themselves and Acosta comes across in such a how can I say in an age of social media he's gold dust essentially you know I even seen on MotoGP's Instagram they had a behind the scenes camera from the weekend and he said that I think he was speaking to a journalist and they were like are you flying home tonight from Portimao and he says no no I'm 8 hour drive in the van you know like just that little type of he's relatable in that sense that's what people really want to see with their riders especially yeah and i think there's a to sort of make that comparison with rossi there's a sort of um charisma that he's got that's just it's sort of lovable and it is very grounded but you you sort of get the impression like you know that he knows where he is and what he does you know for a living like he's got he's in a very good position he's this young teenager riding motor GP bikes, but it doesn't—he doesn't let it phase him, and he's got this this personality that is, I think, relatable for a lot of people. And like you said, in the current generation where social media is king, he's perfect for it. There's even the with his team, you see it after the race, the the joke about the L plate, which the is back of the helmet, yeah, yeah which yeah. is hilarious because a lot of riders come into motor GP and you don't sort of see them have anything like that anything relatable or something that's a bit of a joke that that people can have a laugh from and he's got that and the fact that he has such a good relationship with his team as well that they can they can be that way and they can be so relaxed on a race weekend is i think testament to him and the team that he's in and the environment that's being created then at the same time when you take his personality away and you just the rider himself you sort of, it's, it's almost like he's molded between Rossi and Marquez because his riding style is a little bit like Mark Marquez. Yeah. Quite aggressive. Obviously, I can't count on two hands how many saves he's had in the first two <laughs> rounds. <laughs> he had another one trying to overtake Banyaya, which was very Mark Marquez esque. Um, so I think just the total package that he has is, is incredible. He's lovable off the track, his riding style is lovable on the track. Um, and I think just going forward, he's he's exactly what MotoGP need. Yeah. Um, and I think he's he's destined for a lot of success in MotoGP. And yeah, just little things as well, you know. When you think when he joined the championship, he was he was well, he still is a kid. <laughs> when you think about it, but he couldn't speak really any English. And then Aki Ayo, whatever Aki Ayo does, you know, they all put them through this where you know they are PR trained to media, but not in a sort of regiment the way they learn English really well they come across to the media very well how important is that for someone of like you say he's like a sponge he just absorbs everything how important is that for someone's development yeah I mean it, it to be any kind of top sportsman these days isn't it you, you need to have that in your armory the, the ability to communicate to everybody because also with social media you can reach so many people directly yeah. now, can't you that you don't even need to go through a, a tv screen almost so yeah, it's definitely part of it, and uh, yeah, he's learned from all the people that came before, hasn't he? I think who's, his idols are guys like Kevin Schwantz and Casey yeah. Stoner. So again, he, you know, you put those two together, you got the the personality, the flamboyance, and then that awesome riding style of Casey Stoner as well. So you sort of see that, and yeah, you know, he's it's 
heavy braking seems to be the area that he particularly enjoys on the bike, which again adds up with what Rob was saying about Mark Marquez's riding style. And we all know Mark on the brakes, don't we, from all those years at Honda. So, yeah, he is. You can you can see bits of a lot of famous riders in what he does, but at the same time, he's still Pedro Costa. It's not artificial. He's not trying to to mimic somebody or to yeah. to, to 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 be somebody he isn't. It's very natural, and that's the key because people know if if something is. Uh, is not real, don't they? Or someone's trying to be something they're not. He always seems, look, I'm just being myself. He, uh, he he quipped on the weekend, for example, someone asked him about the spec of his bike. And he said, look, I'm not my crew chief. I don't know. I just ride it. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a natural reply. It's not scripted what he does. And I think that's the key thing as well. Yeah. Uh, and by the end of his Model 2 career, we knew he was going into Model GP. And, you know, signing for Harvey Poncheral's team, Rob, it, it was a clear indication that KTM wanted to give him full backing. You know, we've seen it this year, even whatever the factory KTM team are testing, he has it as well. You know, he's treated like the third factory rider. And from that first test in Valencia, you know, it was the, a big day. Of course, Mark Marquez on the Ducati for the first time. But the other story was that was Pedro Acosta and just how he adapted so quickly you know he wasn't afraid to drop the right height device after a few laps he was loving that and just even his first comments you know you really seen you know he's made for MotoGP he really wants this yeah I think he couldn't have have landed in a better position obviously to be on a KTM which is one of the top two three bikes on the grid was a perfect environment to be in but then at the same time like we spoke about with Akiayo I think a lot of credit has to go to Hervé Poncheral for the job he does with young riders and yep. that team. And he, he seems to be able to get the best more often than not out of a young rider and make them feel comfortable more than anything. And we've seen already through you know, the winter period and the first two rounds, that relationship he's got with Poncherel. And I think yeah. that for Acosta is big, that he has someone who can be so relatable and almost like a very rider-friendly team principal and someone who can always be there and always give him what he needs to, to go fast, essentially. Um, and then to your point about Valencia, you know, when he came into pit lane and was, well, can't repeat the words on the podcast, um, <laughs> but he was very, very excited by the potential of a MotoGP bike. And I think it was Maverick Vinales who, after a couple of laps, he was trying to follow and almost race. Yeah, that's right. And it's just, he couldn't help it. It's just that young attitude and wanted to prove himself. And I think, you know, what he did in Valencia was impressive. What he did throughout testing was, we've spoken about it before, was was immense. Um, and it's just like it's been throughout his whole career. It's just been, in a very short period of time, a, just a continuous upwards trajectory that's that doesn't appear like it's stopping. Um, and I think going forward, that team is going to be great for him this year. Obviously, remains to be seen what happens next year. Yeah. Potentially joining the factory team. That That's something that, that KTM will pro- are, well probably already considering, um, but I think Acosta is in is in a perfect situation for the next well for this year and going forward. Yeah, like Rob says, Pete, you know he is in probably the best setup that he could have had in his career. When you think about the KTM program, you know, like I say, Red Bull rookies champion, Moto three champion, all on KTM's, and then you get to Moto two. Of course, he's in the IO Red Bull KTM team setup. You learn from Remy Gardner in his first year when Remy wins the world title. It it just is perfect for his development as he heads into MotoGP to be riding on a KTM. He essentially is the golden egg that they have. And you know, for you know what it was like for so many years, Pete. There was so much talk of Mark Marquez going to KTM and that would be the final piece. But in the space of what, three years, we've seen the golden egg come out of Moto three and it is Pedro Acosta. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it sort of everything came together, hasn't it, with Acosta in a way. KTM they 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 tried sort of bringing in a big star rider, Johan Zarka, wasn't it? That was the that yeah. first. That was their idea. We need we need to get a top rider in, and that will be the way to success. That obviously went completely wrong. So then they went back and they've gone to a system that a bit like Ducati, where you you train the young riders up, don't you? You bring them yeah. in young. Uh, as, as we've seen Ducati doing in recent years. So they, they, they're they not afraid to change them. You know, as they realise something isn't working, they'll change tact and go completely with it. And, uh, you know, so they've concentrated on the young guys. Acosta was there, so it's the right moment, right time. And he comes in, perfect, it's super talent. As you guys have said, he's, not, he's in with Hervé Contreras' team, which is all ideal situation for a rookie, isn't it? The full factory support, technically, 
but also that family atmosphere that we yeah. hear Mark Marquez talk about at Grassini. Well, that's what Acosta's got at, at, at uh, the Tech Tour team now. So you've got that mix of you haven't got all that pressure that you get if you're in a factory team of results, results, results. You know, you, it, it's obviously pressure. You need to perform, but it, it is a different atmosphere, I think, in a satellite team, and especially teams like Hervé Pancheral. So that's working well. You then look at who's alongside him, Paul Trafabin, his crew chief. Yeah. He was with Paul Espargaro, you know, for years. That was, that was a, a really successful partnership. They seem to have hit it off straight away, don't they? And, uh, yeah. and that, I think that's important. It's interesting because there is this big age gap, you know, that there wasn't with Paul Trevath and, and Paul Espargaro. They were much nearer and then also nearer just in terms of both having young families and that kind of thing. Here, in comes a teenager, you know, to work with in Acosta, to work with Paul. And yet straight away, they have this great relationship. And we've seen in the past, it, it often works that way. Rossi, yeah, Terry Burgess, big age yeah. gap there. Lorenzo, Ramon Fulcada. So interesting that they were well, and crucial to his success, that they've instantly had that bond as a rider and a crew chief. And of, of course, if in the future he does change teams, let's see uh, what happens there. But Paul Trevathan would surely go with him. So he's yeah, that course, assurance that he's going to have that that partnership with him wherever he goes. But for his rookie year, I think, as you guys have said, perfect place to be in, uh, in Tech 12. I like the comparison you made there about the crew chief relationship. You know, is so crucial like you say you know Mick Doon, Gary Burgess and then Rossi just inherited that and you've seen just how that worked out you know even Santi Hernandez Mar Marquez from the Moto2 days it just built an incredible relationship like you say with Paul Trevathan and Pedro Acosta I really like that point with the age gap you know he probably can't believe his, who he has you know he has someone that's, like you say he's like a sponge and we'll just go yeah if you want to do that we'll do it and it's just if it doesn't work whatever, we'll try something else. And, like, you know, it's only his second Grand Prix that he had in MotoGP, and he's already finished on the podium, you know, the third youngest ever in the Premier class, Rob. It's just, what what's going to happen next for Pedro Acosta? The sky is the limit. Um, You know, he's got, I think it's by Saxon Ring to become the youngest ever Correct, MotoGP yeah. race winner, which, you know, given the speed he's shown, we probably all thought that maybe some some top fives in the first half of the season, maybe the odd podium, but the fact that he's he's you know had a podium already and his speed isn't slowing down, he's only going to get stronger as the season goes on. I think at least more podiums, if not a win, is achievable by by Saxon Ring by that magic number to become the youngest. Um, and you know he he's the sort of rider who won't say that that's something that's on his mind and I genuinely believe that to be the case but if he's got the potential to achieve such a result yeah. I think we're going to we're going to see him start to really really push in a race to try, try and achieve that because you know for a lot of Spaniards Mark Marquez is is the guy to look to you know the success yeah. he's had the riding style everything about Mark Marquez for a young Spanish rider is something to to feed off and to to look towards um, as an icon of the sport and for Acosta P made a great point you know he's got parts of him that are maybe a little bit like Mark Marquez but he's Pedro Acosta at the end of the day he's his own man yeah. he'll want to prove that Pedro Acosta is better than Mark Marquez you know he doesn't want to replicate he wants to be his own rider um, and just the point about the team that he's in and working with his crew chief something that I think also has, is going to help him this year before he goes into a factory team. Not that it's something that would probably bother him, but the fact that he's joined MotoGP as a rookie and doesn't have a superstar teammate next to him, like a Brad Binder or a Banyaya, someone who's ready to win the world title and push the project yeah. on to a really high degree. I think having someone like Augusto Fernandez, who's in his second year and seems to be struggling actually so far, I think that yeah. that's just helped the team almost say we haven't got a superstar that we need to take care of. Acosta's already becoming our superstar and they can really focus in on Acosta who then um, and you know that point about Mark Marquez joining KTM <laughs> there's almost no room for him anymore because Binder's not going anywhere in terms of the, the factory team Acosta is is the rider to go to now so um, I think the sky is the limit for him this year I think a race win at some point um, is definitely on the cards yeah I really like that point Rob about the teammates so like I say, he was in that environment when, when Remy Gardner won the Moto2 World title. He was Moto3, obviously, and they both were world champions. He then was teammates with Augusto in 22, when Augusto won the world title. And he's kind of, 
it's a good thing he's been surrounded by people that have won world championships and he knows what winning is like in a team and I personally think no matter who his teammate is he doesn't care I think he will just go okay if, if they're faster than me they're faster I can learn from this and we've known from his CV and his talent that he will get there eventually he will just be able to match them beat them you know incredible and like you said with the Saxon ring that'll be the race that he has until then I just have this this thought that I imagine it was Mark Marquez versus Pedro Acosta at the Saxon ring you know was, oh, th- th- that would be that would that would be now Liberty Media if you are listening to this that's a reason for you to buy MotoGP that yeah, would be the market of dreams ring. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the media dream so it would but yeah Pedro Acosta the sky is the limit and I can't wait for this season yeah enjoyed that chat guys very good and I hope that Pedro uh, just keeps going the way he does because we're very lucky to have someone like him in our sport if you enjoyed the show make sure to subscribe give us a rating on Apple Podcasts wherever follow us on Spotify you'll never miss an episode make sure to like the video on YouTube subscribe to our YouTube channel as well head to Christ.net for everything MotoGP and of course all the other motorsports that we cover and until next time we'll see you then